I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service physical gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies to help you survive and thrive the financial system reset that we are already walking through and it should be pretty apparent to everybody. I don't think it necessarily is, though I don't know why. At any rate, we had so many questions that came in, and you know I like to answer all of the questions. So I'm just going to dive right in and begin. So Hector Pitty asks, Is it okay to refinance a fixed 30-year mortgage for a fixed 15 years? I heard debt is better to have fixed a 30 years because this is how wealth transferring works. All right. Now, it, it, here's my answer. It depends, okay? It depends on what rate you are current, currently paying and what the cost to convert it from a 30-year fix to a 15-year fix would be. Your payment will go up on a 15-year fix. But for example, when I bought this house, I bought it at a 15-year fixed. So I'm just about done paying for this house because of when I bought it. Would I today buy that? Mm, I don't know. It's a different circumstance than it was. Here's the advantage of having a 30-year fix or having any mortgage fixed rate at all. If you, if you had thrown in the word variable in there, you got to know my answer would be different. But if it's a fixed rate mortgage, then I then you're going to use, in part of the strategy, you're going to use gold to pay that mortgage off. So 30 years, that's fine. Your payments are lower. Again, it depends on the interest rate that you're paying. I mean, if you can refinance and lop a few percentage points off, it might make some sense or... It might just make some sense to stay put in your 30-year fixed, take any excess that you have, buy gold with it right now. Then when the government resets the currency against gold and we see gold go up toward its fundamental value, then you sell off a little bit of your gold holdings to pay that whole mortgage off. So really, at the end of the day, when we're done with this, when you when we conclude this whole strategy, you would be debt-free. Not only would you be debt-free, but you would own a lot of assets. So, you know, it, it, it kind of depends. I, I would say, Hector, call one of our consultants and have that conversation Let's see really where you're at completely, and then you can make an educated choice that supports your best interest first. And Freezer Dinner Lady asks, can you explain how to protect your money by purchasing gold and silver? I'm new to this and don't understand. Great question, Freezer Dinner Lady. Um, okay, gold and silver are monetary metals and they form the foundation historically of money in our system. So you're not really buying gold as much as you are converting your fiat money, which is a government-based money that loses value through inflation. That's the plan. It always has. That's how they set it up. And you're converting it into real money that inflation actually can, it isn't that it benefits from inflation, it's that it holds its value over time. So that's really how you protect your money and your purchasing power by converting fiat into real money. And I hope I answered your question. If I didn't really, um, let me know and give me another shot at that because it's critically important that you understand that piece. Fiat is government-backed, government-based money. And I will say this as well. We've been told what backs our currency. The full faith and credit 
of the US government or of any government, right? So let's translate that. As long as you trust the government to repay the debt, you have faith. Then you will continue to loan them money, extend them credit. So the bills that are in your wallet or the digital currency that's in your checking account, etc., is based upon the government's ability to grow more debt. How safe do you think that is? Because the more debt you grow, the more interest you have to pay, the less value that money has. But gold money and silver money is used across the entire swatch of the global economy, so it has a lot more functions and the broadest base of buyer of any asset. That's why it holds its value over time. So I hope that going into that helps you see that a little bit more. And Quadman72 asks, is there a chart that shows the amount of futures contracts for gold silver traded? Um, actually, there are a bunch of charts because as a contract, they expire every month. So if you go into the um, CME group, if you put in your search bar, contracts for gold and silver at CME, and remember there are other exchanges as well. So you'd have to, it's not just one, it's multiple, but yeah, you can pull up all the charts and you can actually look down the row at all the different gold and silver contracts and you'll see how many contracts are written and you'll see the price range. So yeah, it's on the CMA, CME website. You can access it. Anybody can. John Doe asks, what should I do with my gold that is not pre-1933? Trade it in for pre-1933? Well, John, I got to tell you, you have to do what you are comfortable with first. But that is definitely the choice that I made once we got to a certain point in the trend cycle. Because I am one of those that 100% believes that desperate governments do desperate things and there is clearly precedence for over gold confiscation. So that's where I'm most comfortable. Um, it, and it, but it also kind of depends. Maybe you have some pre-1948 fractional, so less than an ounce, gold coins from, you know, Great Britain or France or wherever, sovereigns, francs, roosters, etc. In that case, that's what I personally like for handling things like, um, like uh, property taxes and things like that. So it, it depends on what you're holding, but personally, I don't hold any bullion, which is anything that is new. I don't hold any of that at all. I have converted that, what I did hold, because I used to use it for tax planning. I mean, it has a place. I'm not saying that it doesn't, but um, whatever I didn't use for taxes, yeah, once we got to a certain point in the trend cycle, I was personally no longer comfortable holding it, so I converted it. You do what you're comfortable doing. And Eric Ho asks, is this legal at all, BlackRock? <laughs> I love this question, Eric, thank you. Uh, is this legal at all, BlackRock buying their own bonds? Yeah, and it's even legal for them to borrow the money interest-free from the Fed to do it. <laughs> yes. It is legal because the system is based on contracts. And since you guys and the public doesn't never think who reads the contracts. So whose benefit do you think any of these things are going to be written in? You know, I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. Yeah, it's legal. I wish it wasn't, but a lot of what's going on right now should be illegal. It's certainly unethical and immoral, but illegal, no. And that's what the courts care about, so. Uh, and you even um, heard in a recent Q&A that I did where, you know, there is, this is a, a central bank dominated market. They're managing these markets. They're going to do whatever they need to do to make things appear like everything's okay as they're transferring the wealth away from the public. 
And Leah Hollins asks, what percentage of my savings should I put into precious metals, please? Well, again, Leah, I have to say that, or Lee, I have to say that it really depends on what your personal circumstances are. That's why we do custom strategies because your circumstances, even though we're doing the same basic, I mean, if you're executing the strategy, that's the strategy that I created for myself. But I'm 65 years old. Uh, I am in a certain financial position. I have my family over here. So I have specific goals and the strategy is supportive of those goals. You might have different circumstances, different amounts to work with. You know, maybe you're retired, maybe you're still working. All of these factors would determine what percentage of your savings that you should put in precious metals and what percentage of your savings you should hold in cash outside of the system too. So I would suggest that you call us or you go to the Calendly link below and you set some time to talk with one of our consultants. They all, they all know how to do the strategy. They have spreadsheets, they have formulas, they have questions, and they'll be able to help you define what that looks like for you. And Bull Dag asks, does this balloon have a max size? Yes, it does, but nobody knows what that is. We will, however, find out. And, you know, it should be pretty apparent from what happened uh, last Thursday with the markets imploding, you know, almost 2,000 points, and then what happened subsequently, because that wasn't just happening in this country, but it was happening globally. So they came out, the central banks came out, and they're even more aggressively pumping. So the balloon has holes in it. Lots and lots of holes in it. So I would say that it's actually already reached max size. It's how much they can keep pumping in and how quickly they can to attempt to reflate it or at least keep it at the same level. And we're going to find that out in the future. I don't, I don't know what the answer to that is. Nobody does. And Cheap Laugh Kennedy asks, so can this printing go to Centillion? Yeah, why not? I mean, when everything is digital, there is an unlimited amount of it and it's based upon the confidence. But when you're looking at physical gold and silver or anything physical, it's finite. There are so many of these blue glasses that exist in the world or even that could be created because it's physical. There's so many trees in the world. There's so many ounces of gold. There's so many ounces of silver. And that's why gold and silver as money holds its value better. It's because of those limitations and why going into the centillion or whatever is even beyond that. Sure they can. Sure they can. Because it's an unlimited, it's an infinite amount. And what have central banks said? There's no limit to what we'll do. We'll do this for as long as we need to. Do you really think there are no really, really bad consequences for most people from this? There are also some good consequences for people from this. That's what the gold and silver positions you to be in. Be in that group that end up benefiting from this because it really shouldn't always be about the bad guys benefiting, frankly. Let the good guys benefit. And uh, Hector Pity, okay, Hector Pity asks, what would happen if gold gets into a bubble? We are so far away from that, but of course, everything that goes up must come down. Will they overshoot when people really understand and they still have the ability to buy into the gold market? You know, once they, once they do that revaluation, that's just the start of it. Will gold go into a bubble? In, in nominal terms, yeah, it certainly could. Not yet, though, because it's so severely undervalued. Right now, it would have to go way, way, way past. Maybe, maybe, well, depends on whether you're just comparing the U.S. 
where you're looking at the world. But when I recently, so that means it's more than this now, looked at the world fundamental value of an ounce of gold, it was an 11,500. So you would really have to see gold in nominal terms if they stop printing all of the money that they're printing today, which obviously we know that's not gonna happen. Would, would be at 50, 60, 100,000, 200,000 in order to be classified as a bubble. But will it overshoot? Probably so. So that's why what we look for are patterns. That's why I talk about patterns all the time. Because you really always want to have the lion's share of your wealth, or at least I do, in an undervalued asset that is in a long-term positive trend and the least amount of your wealth in an overvalued asset that is in a long-term negative trend. You know how you know that these fiat markets, these government-based markets are overvalued regardless of what anybody says? Because the central banks want more inflation. And what that really means is they're telling you dollars, euros, yen, whatever, any of those fiat monies, they're overvalued. And that's the foundation of these contracts and stocks and bonds. That's the foundation of intangible wealth. So Aaron Tanner asks, if everyone is aware that metals are suppressed, why won't the miners take charge and all agree to completely stop selling at the fake prices. Well, that's kind of what happens when it goes below their cost to mine, because it does, it takes energy, it takes labor, it takes a lot, not just to mine an ounce of gold. Silver is kind of a byproduct, so that's a little bit easier, but uh, it's also to mine it and then also take it through the whole process where it's usable. And if you see spot, that's why spot can go to 700, but you're going to see the premiums explode because miners actually would not be able to sell gold for below their cost to mine. They would simply stop mining. So shouldn't they all agree to completely stop selling at the fake prices? Well, that, that's up to them. They have costs. They're going to have to sell it, <clears throat> excuse me, to cover their costs or they're going to go out of business. It's kind of the same thing with oil, right? They're still producing it, even though it's below their cost to produce because they have to pay their bills. It's the same kind of thing. And oil too. There's a finite amount of oil. Doesn't matter if it's in the ground or above the ground. And there's a finite amount of it. Maybe more than we need at the moment, but. Excuse me. And Paul N. asks, what do you think are the largest differences between Canada and the U.S. besides no gold in Canada? Um, I really don't quite, I mean, the U.S. has a lot more clout globally than Canada does. One of my son-in-laws is Canadian, you know, so I have, you know, warm fuzzies about Canada. But uh, I don't really know that I can answer that. They have a different kind of government system as well. I think they're more socialist up there. Uh, we can see their medical system up there. So there's a lot of differences between the U.S. and Canada. And um, is that, yep, okie dokie. So I just was with Gerald Salente on Coffee with Lynette. It was, as always, a very heated and excellent discussion. I encourage you to go watch that. And I was with DJ Randy on Standing on the Edge BFAM 109.6. And I'm certain that you will find that interview very enjoyable as well. This coming week, I'm on with Miles Wakeham from Be Unconstrained, and that is always a very good discussion on 101. So if you are particular, first of all, everybody needs to go back to the basics, but if this is something that's new to you, I would encourage you to watch those. Make sure that you visit our blog, itmtrading.com forward slash blog, and of course, this and all of our other videos are posted on Brightian as well as Facebook. 
So if you have any other questions or you want to get specific to your circumstances, click that Calendly link below and make an appointment to talk to one of our consultants. They're all trained in the strategy and they're very happy to answer any questions that you might have. I'd like you to keep in mind, because this has come up from time to time, that the strategy is based on real money, gold, and silver as well as repeatable patterns. Because even though I can't guarantee what's gonna happen tomorrow, I don't know, you know, history always repeats. So if this is something that's happened 100% of the time in the past, yeah, I'm thinking it's gonna happen again in the future. And because of that, you need to make sure that you are covering your assets. And how do you do that? with your financial shield, which is made up of physical gold and physical silver, definitely not paper or promises. If you like this, please give us a thumbs up. Make sure that you share all of these videos with anybody that will watch them because honestly, everybody needs to know what's happening. I mean, how many times can you be lied to when you don't know the truth? So until next we meet, Please be safe out there. Bye-bye.